Minha esposa tá, vai confirmar aqui para mim. Sim, eu estou aqui também no, no YouTube, estou vendo também. Ah, tá vendo? Já entramos, então? Não, ainda não. Ainda não? É, ele tem um atraso um pouquinho. Sim, agora sim. Agora sim, sim. ótimo. Bom, well, we are all set to start then. So, I wanna uh, say good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our event. This is the fifth talk of the International Seminar Series in Ecology, hosted by the Graduate Program in uh, Ecology of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Um, questions from our audience can be posted in the chat box on YouTube during or, or after the talk, so that Professor Jordano can address them at the end of his talk. And questions can be either in Portuguese, English, Spanish, or Portuguese. So let me welcome Professor Pedro Jordano, who is a research professor at the Estación Biológica Doñana of the Spanish Council for uh, Scientific Research. Pedro's uh, research focuses on the study of biodiversity from both uh, ecological and evolutionary perspectives. And he is interested in how ecological interactions uh, shape complex uh, ecological systems, especially mutualisms and uh, uh, among plants and uh, seed dispersers and pollinators. Pedro's main research addresses this fascinating theme and includes tools from field ecology, molecular genetics, and theoretical ecology. And probably you are all aware, but Pedro is one of the main scientists leading studies on mutualisms and interaction networks. He has published over 200, 250 papers, which were cited over 30,000 times. That is to say how deeply honored I am to have you here today, Pedro. And on behalf of the program, I want to thank you very, very much for kindly accepting our invitation. And when you want to go. Muito obrigado, Jeff. É um, pra, um prazer, é uma, uma honra para mim la, o convite de, da pós-graduação da, da Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul e também do Instituto de Biociências. É realmente um privilégio para mim é, poder dar a palestra. É uma uma honra. Eu vou, vou deixar meu portunhol e vou, vou trocar para, para meu Spanglish para o conteúdo da, da, da palestra. Vou a iniciar compartilhar aqui. So, thank you very much. Also to all the people that are attending the, attending the, the conference, the seminar. It's uh, really a great pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, so thank you very much, Jeff. So today what I want to do for you is uh, just to give a, a very general overview, uh, talking um, about very different aspects of, of uh, ecological interactions. Bro broadly speaking, ecological interactions are extremely diverse in, in natural ecosystems. And they are an important component of biodiversity. So after all, I'll be talking uh, today about biodiversity, but a different type of biodiversity to the one that you may have in mind, because I'm going to talk about the other side of biodiversity, not the species themselves, but the interaction. So actually the interaction. So I'll be talking about bi biodiversity's interactum, and I'll define what I mean by that later on, and how we are understanding and mapping the ecological functions that are embedded in, in highly complex networks of ecological interactions among, among species on, on Earth. So in the first part of, of, of the talk, I, I'll, I'll give you a uh, very broad overview, a highly summarized overview of uh, our research in, in the last 20 years, emphasizing the main aspects of, I think I'm, it's okay, I'm sharing okay, the, Oh, okay. It, the main aspects of uh, our research on networks and, and in trying to explain quite briefly what we mean about those uh, networks of, of interaction. So 
uh, how this important component of biodiversity can be assessed and, and studied. And then in the second part, I'll be I'll be focusing on interaction webs and ecological functions. How are we mapping the ecological functions that we represent in different links in those complex uh, networks? So uh, one thing, Jeff, uh, I, th I think I have a problem with the with the sharing of the screen that is a bit delayed. Uh, yeah, on YouTube, you will show uh, a little later. Uh, uh, there is a delay, but yeah, everyone yeah. is seeing your screen. Uh, OK, perfect. So but what I'm not sure is, is that they are uh, viewing the slide that I have in my screen. Because uh, I think they are. I think they are, Pedro. OK, it's perfect. It's just a delay. You can yeah. continue. OK, perfect. So thank you so much. Uh, sorry for the interruption. So uh, the main focus would be on biodiversity. And I like very much to, to start my talks with this, uh, this example, just because of two reasons. First, I think it's a powerful analog to what I mean when uh, emphasizing the, the importance of interactions, of ecological interactions for our understand, un understanding of biodiversity. And second, because it, it is a, a, a humble homage to Professor Margalev the best uh, Spanish ecology ever. And he helped me a lot when I started to study uh, mutualistic interactions between plants and animals and helping me a lot with my first manuscript, especially the American Naturalist uh, paper that I published many years ago. Uh, so it's, a, it's an homage to, to Margalef because in, in this very nice paper with Gutierrez in 1983 in American Naturalist, they compare the diversity measures that you can obtain when sampling uh, natural habitats, natural ecosystem, and then comparing them to what they call human uh, built artifacts that, that function. For instance, they took uh, a mecano set like uh, this small uh, jeep here, they dismantled the set and then counted the, the number of parts. It's a set that, that has uh, 270 pieces of 38 different types. And then they inventoried the diversity of pieces that uh, are integrating this set. And I like very much an idea that Professor Margalev uh, already advanced in, in his textbook on ecology, Ecologia, published in 1974, and is that even if we, if we have for a complex system like th this small toy, all the inventory of the different components that make up this small set, that is not enough to understand its function. So it is highly improbable that if we randomly connect all those elements here, sampling them uh, at random, we will get, we will end up uh, finishing with a a functional uh, set like this one. We need a subtle ingredient to understand the function of those complex systems. And that ingredient is simply how the different elements are connected. What are the relationship among them? So we, we have some components that may interact with many different pieces, like those small screws here, and then others that are quite unique, like the tires or the gas depot that only interact with one piece. So we need to understand how all those pieces are connected to try to understand the functionality of the whole system. So the, exactly the same works for natural systems, for natural assemblages of species, where if we, if we are uh, evolutionary ecologists and we aim to uh, understand the processes of coevolution among interacting species, especially if they are free living species in natural ecosystem, like those staphylinid beetles that live uh, symbiotically with ants uh, within the ant nests, or the wonderful radiation of fleshy fruited uh, angiosperms in relation to fruit consumption and seed dispersal by animal frugivores or for instance, all the diversification of secondary compounds in plants in relation to the uh, defense mechanisms uh, against uh, animal herbivores, 
we need to understand how they interact. We need to understand what are the frequencies of interaction. What we, we need to inventory, not just the biodiversity of a species, but also the biodiversity of interactions. It is, uh, so for instance, for coevolution, the idea, it is the, this advanced in 19, in 2009 by John Thompson in this paper in American Naturalist where he, he said that to understand coevolution, we need to understand evolution with interactions. So no, not just the interaction between two different genotypes, but the, the interaction between those genotypes in the shared environment that they, they live in. So evolution is more than more than G by E interactions. E, e interaction is a G by G by E interactions. The interaction between a, a species that are probably very far away in, the, in their phylogenetic relationships among them, but that then they encounter each other and then interact maybe with a negative or positive or neutral outcomes for those species. So all those interactions are a central, a fundamental part of, on, uh, of biodiversity, but then uh, a, a ecological studies to assess biodiversity normally focus on a species themselves and not just on interactions. So what is the, what they call biodiversity's interacton? is a central property of a complex system. So interactons are a basic component, a basic piece of complex systems. And biodiversity itself is a complex system and biodiversity's interacton is a whole suite of ecological interactions that take place on Earth, among all living species on Earth. We have also a sting interaction that would be those interactions that when sting, when a species become a sting. But we'll talk about the extinction of interactions later, later in the talk. So interactions are just encounters, interspecific encounters among, among species. They, they just depend on the probability of interaction encounter, the PIE in, in any particular community. And uh, usually we, we summarize the encounters between species. But actually what happens in nature are encounters between individuals of, of each species. We just summarize, we pull all those individual based interactions in to, to get a picture, to get an inventory of, of who is interacting with whom and how the mutual dependencies among species build up within complex, uh, highly complex networks of interactions. And then the complexity of any interaction that we, we can assess, for instance, in a particular ecosystem, in a particular uh, locality, in a particular habitat, can be quite complex. So, for instance, here is this very nice uh, representation of the interactions between frugivorous animals. Here represented uh, each species by a single dot here. And then uh, fleshy fruited plants in this a beautiful uh, biome that is a Mata Atlantica in southeastern Brazil. And it's a paper by Wesley Silva and collaborators. And they depict is just an inventory of who is interacting with whom. It's quite an analog to if uh, exactly the same that if we inventory a biodiversity uh, assemblage just by documenting the present absence of a species. Here we document the present absence of interactions among species and are represented by, by those links in these that we call technically a bipartite network uh, with two different modes, a subset of uh, nodes that are the animal frugivores and a subset of nodes, a different subset of nodes that are the fleshy, produ uh, fleshy producing woody plants. And then uh, the other element of the network would be the huge amount of interactions that we can inventory in those systems. That would be a really complex network. And in the last, I would say, 20 years, 20, 20 some years, uh, we have been uh, doing a lot of effort in trying to understand those complex uh, structures. We, uh, we uh, try to develop methodologies to characterize the, the topology the structure, 
the patterns that we can analyze when we analyze, uh, when we assess those interactions among sets of, let's say here, different animal species interacting with different plant species in, in any type of interaction, mutualistic, antagonistic, competitive, facilitative, symbiotic, and so on. Commensalism, uh, any type of interaction can be represented as a graph that uh, represents how the different species, the different nodes of the graph are linked together uh, through interactions. And, and we have different, we may have different descriptors like degree distribution, that like interaction asymmetry, nestedness, modularity, and other type, other different type of statistics that help us to understand the, the topology and structures of network. So basically, network ecology help, helps us in three main ways. The first one is that if you if your objective is, is to understand complexity you need to first to visualize the complexity and in the in the slide before we visualize the tremendous complexity of the plant frugivore interactions in the atlantic forest you need to visualize the complexity second you need to analyze the complexity you need to be able to develop descriptive uh, tools to uh, describe the topology and structure of that complexity and third you need modeling tools to compare the observed empirical structure with null models so that you can test expectations about your hypothesis of why are the distribution uh, distributed, the, the interactions distributed in the way that they are in the, in the natural habitat. And the main results of those last, I would say, 20 some years of research on complex interaction networks in ecological systems that there are some generalized macroscopic properties. What I call, what I call generalized macroscopic uh, properties. It, what I mean by that is that independently on the type of interaction that you are studying, whether it is a plant herbivore antagonistic interactions or a plant pollinator interactions or an interaction of ants defending plants or a cleaning relationship between those crustacean species like this one here, cleaning the fish in the reef, uh, in, in the coral reefs, or plant frugivore inter mutualistic interactions or competitive and so on. There are generalized patterns. There are patterns that we observe repeatedly, consistently, irrespective of the type of interaction and the biome, the biographic area where we study that interaction. Those properties are basically summarized here. We have a specific degree distribution. We have a specific frequency distribution of the number of interactions per species. Those are uh, largely non-random patterns of variation in the number of interactions per species. Second, we have generalized weak links. If we observe interactions, we are observing weak interactions. Interactions are in general weak. It is extremely difficult to, re to record, to register a very strong mutualistic interaction, a very strong antagonistic interaction. Only we record that for interactions that have very high specificity, specificity of interaction, sometimes in some uh, host parasite interactions or some endosymbiotic interactions. There is a strong and pervasive and highly generalized interaction asymmetry. You depend a lot on me. I don't depend very much on you. This, this is what we found repeatedly in, in different uh, communities irrespective of the biographic area or the type of interaction. The dependence, the, the, the mutual de dependences among the partners, uh, species, uh, interacting in a pairwise interactions are strongly asymmetric. Uh, I depend a lot on you, you don't depend very much on me. Weak interactions, strongly asymmetric interaction, interactions as also, and also other structural properties that I'm not going to, to explore in detail uh, today because of uh, lack of time. So for instance, in the last uh, years, together with uh, Jordi Vasconte and Jens Solesen, we have been uh, doing a tremendous effort in trying to 
to develop and to bring concepts and, and uh, conceptual tools and conceptual frameworks from the areas of, of mathematical topology and uh, statistical mechanics in, in physics and, uh, uh, and topology in mathematics to uh, try to understand our ecological networks. So we use we have been using those type of bipartite graphs where we represent the interactions uh, among a set of planet species and we make an inventory of their interactions of those species with the animals that, that are dependent on them and how those planet species are dependent on, on the animals that feed on, the, on their fruits. Uh, and the idea was to try to portray how coevolution, for instance, among uh, free living species in, in, in natural ecosystem uh, can work and, and can, and, and can uh, uh, be ongoing and, and, and resulting from the pairwise interaction that are producing here. So uh, in addition to, moni to monitoring the diversity, the number of species involved here, we also assess the, and we inventory the number of interactions that are present here. So this is a bipartite network uh, that has just two components, the nodes of the network, that would be the species, the links of the network that represent the interactions of mutual dependence, in this case, between mutualistic uh, uh, frugivorous animals and the, and the plants they feed upon and disperse their seeds. So for each of those links, we, we can quantify the interactions and then give a weight to that particular interaction to to just to, uh, to illustrate how dependent is the plant on the animal, how dependent is the animal on the plant. So we may portray those mutual dependencies and then on top of this, build all those an analyzes and, and simulation of the complex networks. So after some years trying to develop all those methodologies and with a very strong emphasis on the on the two main aspects that I highlighted before of visualizing the complexity and analyzing the complexity. In recent years, we are moving to our next step that is uh, trying to advance beyond the mere, the simple description of the network. We want to advance to try to understand what are the functional consequences that are embedded in those highly complex systems of interactions among the species. So, for instance, the kind of, of question that could be related to what are the ecological correlates of the position of the different nodes? Would it be that the species that occupy the central part of the network, they share some particular trait? That is, uh, traits are not distributed uh, at random over the network, but specifically central species, when compared to peripheral species, they share some common, some commonalities on the traits. For instance, large body size, large seed size, a highly nutrient fruits, or high production of nectar, or extended phenophases, extended phenological fruiting or flowering periods, and, and so on. Then for each link that we are able to map here, either qualitatively or quantitatively, how can we map the outcome of interactions? So how can we proceed from a frequentist description of the complex network to a functional description of the network? So advanced to quantifying how many interactions we record to quantify how many different type of functional effects we have, how many different types of what is the magnitude of the functional outcomes that take place in those networks? And so that we are able to map different functions into different links. In that way, for instance, from our conservation biology perspective, we could develop theory to try to understand whether some critical, some crucial functions, crucial ecological services or ecological functions are located in particular sectors of the network, maybe in the core of the network we may have some specific functions that are crucial for the persistence of the whole complex. Mm -hmm. 
into those links, into those thin wires that we have been seeing in the in the network and explore those functional accounts of the interactions. And I like very much this sentence by Professor Dan Jansen. What escapes the eye is a much more insidious kind of extinction. It's the extinction of ecological interactions. So when we assess biodiversity, we also, what we see, for instance, in the media, are news about extinction of a species or news about that a new species has been discovered. But, but biodiversity is more than that. We have interactions among species. The whole architecture of biodiversity that is a complex network, that is the biodiversity's interactum, is based on the survival and the resilience of those links among species. So Dan Jansen's point is very important. Why? Because some interactions can be extinct well before the partner species are extinct. So imagine a tropical forest fragment is a small fragment that has been in a deforested area and there, uh, a small fragment persists there. And maybe we go there to, to make a, a biodiversity inventory. Uh, we heard a toucan there, or we heard some holler monkeys, or we uh, record the tracks of uh, a tapir, but those animals would be in such a low abundance that even if they are not yet locally extinct in, extinct in this habitat, they are functionally extinct. So we find what we, what we call the entry empty uh, forest syndrome. Is that syndrome where you go to the field, you go to the forest, you see a forest that is apparently functioning, the plants are reproducing, producing flowers, producing fruits. Some frugivores go there and are uh, consuming the fruits and dispersing the seeds, but the whole system is not functioning. And it's not functioning because interactions got extinct. So what happens in those networks when we lose crucial effects, like for instance, in plant pollinator interactions, the dispersal of pollen close to the plants in gatonogamous crosses or far away from the plant, emphasizing a cross pollen transfer between different individual plants that could be crucial. For instance, if the species are the tree or the shrub species are dioecious, or um, what are the interactions that are limiting fruit set? Can fruit set be limited because of a lack of interactions there in, that, in a particular habitat? Or for instance, if we look to seed dispersal, we have also extremely important functions, ecological functions, ecological service that help the natural regener regeneration cycle of the plants to survive and to reproduce is in situ dispersal for the recruitment process or dispersal very far away for coloni colonization or for instance for the plant responses to climate change that we need some plant species will need to expand their range limits and their, their geographic range of distribution very far away and they need those services of long distance dispersal how can we assess that that in in our analysis of networks and and then trying to map beyond the frequencies description of the network that we, we do when we compare, for instance, among different individual plants here as green rectangles interacting with individual frugivorous uh, animals here in the red re rectangles. We can just uh, evaluate the number, the visitation frequency, but also if we have some uh, study trying to assess a particular ecological service, like the probability that an individual a fruit eaten by a particular frugivore will be dispersed, the seed will be moved, will be dispersed very far away from, from the plant. That would be a kind of ecological function that we can incorporate in our measure of mutual dependence. We have a mutual dependence here, a quantitative mutual dependence here, D sub i j, that uh, we can multiply by the probability that an individual outcome of a single interaction results in a particular 
ecological service. So there are some ways that we can approach the mapping of those ecological interactions in those, those highly diversified systems. How that will help, help us enormously in, in conservation biology efforts. For instance, in those cases where the mutualistic interactions or, or any type of interactions could be so tight that the disappearance of a single species will, could result in the, in the extinction of the whole set of species that uh, are dependent upon them. Let me put your, your, uh, an example of our work together with uh, Nestor Perez Mendes and Alfredo Valido in the Canary Islands in, in, here in Spain, where we studied the uh, seed dispersal of this uh, narrow endemic species that is Neocamaelea pulverulenta in the family Rutaceae. And this species is uh, exclusively dispersed by the giant frugivorous lizards in the Canary Islands in the genus Galotia. The, there is a tremendous uh, radiation of uh, Galotia species in Canary Islands in historic times, and they are very important frugivores on the island. So the, the, the interactions is quite peculiar because Neocamaelea is exclusively dispersed by the giant lizards, yet the giant lizard, uh, the fruits are not consumed by frugivorous birds or, or by frugivorous mammals, just by the giant lizards. And then the Galotia lizards, they, we, 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 we have inventoried for them a consumption of up to 84 species in the, in the Canary Islands archipelago. So we are studying what are the consequences of the defaunation of the loss of the very large uh, giant lizards. Let, let me explain this with a bit more detail. So those are the Canary Islands here to the west of the coast of Morocco, uh, up around 2,000 uh, kilometers south of from Spain. The, they are true islands. They, they are oceanic islands of volcanic origin. And Neocamalea pulverulenta is strictly distributed in the three central islands in the archipelago, in La Gomera, in Tenerife, in Gran Canaria. Very interestingly, the radiation of the lizard, of the giant lizard in the, in the islands, is not non-random. So almost 2,500 years ago, the first humans, the aborigines, the Guanche people arrived to the island and they started consuming lizards and preying upon other mammals and birds and bird eggs and uh, many different uh, food resources on, on the island. So uh, a situation that was also worsened uh, almost 500 years ago when the first Occidental people from Europe, uh, uh, Europe uh, arrived in the island, they introduced cats and rats, another exotic species, also consumed the large uh, lizards, so that the largest lizard species that were found in the, in the three central islands, in, uh, in the three central island, islands in Gran Canaria, in Tenerife and La Gomera, become extinct. So uh, we, have, we, we have fossils of Galotia goliath, for instance, in, in Tenerife and in La Gomera, but they disappear almost not more than 3,000 3, years ago. And then uh, in Gran Canaria, we still have a giant lizard, Galotia estellini, that is pretty similar in size to the former form of uh, Galotia estellini, to the former form of the uh, giant lizard. So, there is a, a, a full gradient of, of defaunation going from Gran Canaria, where we still have a, a giant lizard, to Tenerife, where, where we have a Galotia galoti, that is a smaller lizard, a highly frugivorous, uh, frugivorous, and also dispersing seeds of Neocamalea, but less efficiently because of the a, a smaller size. And then Galotia cesaris in La Gomera, that is almost strictly uh, insectivorous and doesn't consume the fruits at all or that, uh, does that sporadically because the uh, small size of Galotia cesaris is unable to handle the very large uh, fruit of, of uh, Neocamelia. So we, we map it using uh, genetic techniques on the uh, DNA uh, barcoding of the uh, ma uh, macrosatellites 
direct, obtain it from the endocar of, of the seeds, we were able to track the seed dispersal distance. We sampled seeds from the scats of the, of the giant lizards and then extracted DNA from the endocarp, that is the woody cover surrounding the embryo of the seed, and then compared the multilocus genotype of those endocarps with the genotypes of the plants in the population. We, we sampled and genotyped adult reproductive fruiting plants in the population, in the local population, several thousand plants were genotyped so that we can compare the genotype of a particular seed that we recover from a scat of a lizard dispersed away from the, from the plant and then assign that seed to uh, a maternal plant. Why? Because the multilocus genotype of the endocarp is identical to the multilocus genotype, microsatellite genotype, they uh, obtain it from DNA sample from the leaf of the adult plants. They are maternal tissue, they are both maternal tissue, and the, the genotypes are exact. So it's a direct matching of the two genotypes, and that enables us to uh, obtain the probability density functions for seed dispersal distances in the three defaunation scenarios. What happens? In the scenario that is not defaunated, where Neocamalea is still interacting with the giant lizard Galotia stellini, we have this uh, seed dispersal kernel representing the probability of finding dispersed seed away from the parent plants at different distance in meters here. And we, we see a heavy tail here, a fat tail distribution up to almost 100 meters uh, of seed dispersal distances. When we move to the uh, semi-defaunated uh, Tenerife Island, where the uh, Galotia goliath disappear and the plants are interacting with the smaller Galotia, uh, Galotia galoti, what we have is a truncated uh, seed dispersal kernel that ends up over a very short distance here. So we don't find we don't fight in Tenerife the long tail, the fat tail in the dispersal kernel that we are that we are seeing in the in the non-defaunated Gran Canaria, and then in the super defaunated La Gomera, where the uh, Galotia goliath was also present there, but was extinct. Then and we find just Galotia cesaris, and then the seeds are dispersed very very close to the to the plant, less than four meter meters from the plant and some of those seeds may be just uh, fruits dropped by the small lizards when trying to handle and swallow the the fruits but they are too small to to ingest uh, and to and to and to swallow the the fruit so what we model there is what are the consequences of uh, losing those giant lizards from the uh, non-defaunated scenario in Gran Canaria to the highly defaunated scenario in La Gomera. Those are individual, individual the locations, the spatial location of individual plants, and we assess the patterns of genetic variation, genetic richness within the, the plant population. So uh, each dot here is an individual plant in one of those one hectare plot where we genotyped all the individual plants that were growing there in different plots in, in Gran Canaria, in Tenerife, the mid-defaunated uh, scenario, and La Gomera, the defaunated scenario. It is interesting when we uh, perform the cluster analysis based on the genetic distances among individual plants, it is interesting that in the non-defaunated scenario, while the seeds are being dispersed far away from the plants, the diffusion of the different type of alleles throughout the population is quite wide. And then we find just a single cluster. So most individual plants are genetically related to any other plant that you may sample at random in that particular population. When we move to a defaunated scenario where the dispersal kernel is truncated to shorter distance, we found now distinct, some initial distinct clusters of more closely related, genetically related individuals, and then uh, meaning that individuals growing close together tend to be with a higher probability, tend to be more related than those that you can far, uh, sample at random farther away. So uh, this clustering means that the, the seed dispersal distances probably have a signal in creating a recruitment of 
closely related individuals close together. And then that pattern is very, very marked in the most definitive scenario here where, where we find the, we, we find three different type of cluster of genetic uh, related net clusters in the in the populations so, so that seed dispersal and the functionality of this the dispersal function for those uh, uh, giant lizards appears to be the diffusion the improving and increasing the meta population and the population connectivity in terms of the diffusion of different alleles of different genetic variation throughout the population. We have examined that also at an uh, interpopulation level and working again with complex network to understand for those local populations of Neocamalea pulverulenta in Gran Canaria, the non-defaunated scenario, in Tenerife, the mid-defaunated scenario, and in La Gomera, the defaunated scenario, we are putting here simply how close are the genetic pools of those local populations in terms of shared alleles. So if we assume that in, in the non-defaunated scenario, somehow the long distance dispersal events are still present, we may find a greater connectivity uh, across the different populations that in the more defaunated scenario. And certainly the modularity increases a lot from the more heavily connected populations of the meta population of Gran Canaria that is much better connected than the one, the meta population in Tenerife and compare also to the population of La Gomera. Even also, uh, given the fact that the dispersal distance here need to be much shorter because La Gomera is way smaller than Gran Canaria and Tenerife. So we are exploring now the connectivity uh, across those populations and then finding, trying to, finding out, uh, to find out what are the type of interactions that promote those very extremely long distance seed dispersal events. And those uh, are probably a characteristic feature of oceanic islands and are the secondary dis seed dispersal, especially by pre predatory birds, the kestrels. You have here a, co a male common kestrel coming to the nest and uh, we have photographed uh, it. I photographed it. Uh, look at here. That's a lizard. That's a galotia lizard with seeds, neocamalea seeds inside, in, 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 inside the, the gut, the, inside the stomach and the intestines. So uh, we have sample seeds from Neocamaelea in the in the perches and the nests of the uh, of the kestrels, and you can find genotypes coming from very long distal dispersal events. We have documented. We are, we, we have also monitored the 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 movement patterns of the kestrel in the island, in, the, in different places, and we have monitored seed dispersal events of almost three kilometers in distance. Uh, 2.7 kilometers in distance from the a particular plant to uh, a particular uh, perch position uh, of the kestrel. Now we are using other type of techniques of advanced techniques based on on the uh, molecular identification of of the frugivore species that is dispersing dispersing a particular seed, and together with Juan P. Uh, uh, González Barro and Juan Mi Arroyo. Uh, we have been using DNA barcoding techniques uh, to try to recover DNA uh, from the surface of the scats or regurgitated seeds of the frugivores and then identify a sequence of the cytochrome uh, genes uh, with the barcode, uh, with the DNA barcode li library, the barcode of life uh, library to uh, try to uh, individually uh, assess the frugivore that has been dispersed, dispersing a particular set of seeds that contributing a particular uh, seed dispersal events in, in a given area. So we have been working in, the, in this scenario. It's a highly fragmented uh, woodland hab habitat in the in lowland Spain, and we have been studying the recruitment patterns and the seed dispersal patterns from this uh, shrubland fragment to those. Uh, this uh, agricultural metrics area, as we, we call it, that has some remnant trees. We have been sampling uh, seeds here and then recovering the seeds and then trying to identify what 
which are the frugivore species that are dispersing the seeds within the forest area. And then what is a subset of those frugivore species that are functionally contributing to the long distance potential colonization of the of the abandoned land of the uh, and, are, uh, and, and of course they are potentially contributing to to recruiting uh, the forest in this uh, abandoned uh, agricultural area and you can see that only a proper subset and on random subset of the species that are interacting in this area are the ones that are contributing those uh, long distance movements to the to the to the area and then what happens in those scenarios? What happens when we have a scenarios where on top of losing the species and the species becoming extinct, we lose the interactions. The interactions are lost. What happens, and we already saw that, that example with uh, Galotia and Neocamalea in the Canary Islands, but that is a highly specific interaction, so at least from the point of view of the plant. What happens when we are losing interactions in a more complex, in a much more complex network of interactions. So, from some time ago, I've been collaborating with uh, uh, excellent people in, in in Brazil, in southeastern Brazil, in the Mata Atlantica forest, with the groups of Mauro Galetti and Marco Aurelio Pizzo, and we have been we were interested in 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 trying to understand the consequences of the uh, drastic and the pervasive uh, deforestation that took place since uh, 1500 in the Atlantic forest but that has, was formerly uh, extensive in Sao Paulo state. This is the uh, Sao Paulo state is located here in southeastern uh, uh, Brazil. And you can see how when we progress towards uh, recent times, we see more and more reduction of the Atlantic forest. Um, and now there are uh, only a few rem remnants of this. So not only species are being lost here, but also interactions are being lost in this process. And this has tremendous consequences in terms of the resilience of the uh, plant frugivore networks, the resilience of the plant frugivore mutualistic interactions that support the recruitment and the regeneration of the Atlantic forest. We are losing, basically and briefly, we are losing the very large frugivores here, like jacutingas and toucans, and only in the remnants, in the small fragments that are remnants of the uh, Atlantic forest, we are uh, recording now just the uh, small frugivores like like the thrushes, uh, for instance. So, so the main uh, the main result for that is, is that for that uh, non-random loss of a species is, is that we are losing very large body frugivores uh, that have the ability to swallow to handle and to disperse efficiently very large seeds and very large fruits of the Atlantic forest. In the Atlantic forest, approximately 19% of the woody cover of the woody species, the trees and shrub, are uh, have fruits larger than 12 millimeters diameter. So they need the very large frugivores able to handle efficiently and disperse efficiently the very large seeds of those species. If we lose that component of the frugivore assemblage of the network, we are losing very important dispersal functions. Together with Karin Emmer, we have been monitoring the structure of this meta network. We call a meta network because it's a combination of local network that we can find in different Atlantic, Atlantic forest patches and then documenting what are the type of interactions that are lost or that are gained. The beta turnover of not only of a species but also the beta turnover of pairwise interactions among the different the different areas. And you can see here in those uh, small uh, 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 small representations the type of interaction we are talking about: an interaction between a large frugivorous birds and very large fruits, an interaction between a small frugivorous bird and, and large fruit. A large frugivorous birds and small fruits, or a small frugivorous birds and small fruits. And here you can see how increasing fragment area here from one hectare fragments to more than uh, 100,000 hectares uh, fragments. What is the cum cumulative gain 
gain of different type of pairwise interaction. So this is the overall frequency of interaction that we find now in that meta network in the whole area. So most interactions are between small birds and a, a small fruited species. Very few interactions are between large birds and very fruited species. Of course, we expected that because those are relatively a small fraction of the frugivore assemblage and the plant uh, fleshy fruited assemblage. So we expected a low frequency. But then when we examine how we how we gain, or, or better say, let me put the other way around, how we lose interactions when we increase fragmentation. So going from the pristine site, very large areas and very large sites here to the right, when we proceed increasing fragmentation and decreasing fragment area, we are losing very suddenly, we lose almost all the interactions involving large frugivorous animals and large fruited plant species when we move below 10,000 uh, 10, hectares of fragment area. And then, of course, the, small, uh, the interaction be between small birds and small fruits is much more resilient and is decreasing much more slowly. So those deformation effects are, are having a very deep, a very profound impact in those ecosystems. Why? Because those animals are the gardeners of the forest. The forest depends strongly on them for regeneration. So for instance, we have uh, here a plot that plant of co-physiologists know, know, know very well, that is of the positive relationship that exists between a, a seed diameter and wood density, the trunk, the wood density of the trunk of a given species. The larger the seed, the larger, the, the more amount of wood density that a, a plant species can accumulate. So it is interesting that this would be the threshold that we have when we lose the very large frugivores in the, in the, in the small fragments, where only a small frugivores that are gate limited to disperse those very large fruits uh, and large seeded species are lost. And then we have a subset here in blue, in light blue, that are adequately dispersed by those guys here. But then we are losing all these that are the species that contribute more to the wood density and for, and for that reason for the potential for carbon storage in those habitats. So they have a potential very high impact. When we defaunate a forest, the species are not lost at, at random. They, are, they disappear, the largest seeded trees that have a higher capacity of carbon storage because of the uh, higher density the higher uh, wood density will, will, will disappear uh, much earlier than the uh, soft wooded uh, species here that will be the remnants in the final defaunated community that would be interacting with a highly impoverished community from the the compared to the ones that the one that we have in the pristine forest so we are losing losing here not only the species of frugivore also crucial functions for the survival of the whole community of the Atlantic forest. So we simulated that uh, uh, only very briefly in different places where we have the inventory of the, of the uh, fresh, fleshy fruited species. We simulated the, an increasing percentage of loss of a species of larger seed size, of seed size larger than 12 millimeter and we increase the percentage of those species that were lost and how that will contribute to the, car to the carbon balance and how the potential for carbon storage in, in megagrams per hectare could, could vary when we lost the dispersal ability and the regeneration of the large seeded uh, seed, uh, uh, trees and shrub, the large, large seeded woody species in those habitats. And here you see that we see a very a highly significant degree the, uh, decrease in the in the ability of carbon storage in those habitats. Uh, this is this would be this would be a simulation based on the on a random assumption that the the disappearance of the of the trees with the increasing fragmentation along the fragmentation gradient would be independent of fruit size, and then there we we see uh, almost no no effect. So 
frugivores are having a very large effect also in ecosystem level properties such as uh, carbon balance and other large scale properties of the ecological communities where li they live on. I'm running out, out of my time, but le let's see if I can briefly explain this last part of, of the talk to try to emphasize that we are uh, facing really challenging times in network analysis because to document and to inventory all that biodiversity biodiversity is interacting, we are facing very problematic challenges because of the number and the high complexity of interaction that we have. We are, so far, I've been talking mostly about seed dispersal, but really that all the suite of biotic interactions that a plant population may have to complete their, re fully, their full regeneration cycle uh, can be uh, with uh, many, many different species of mutualistic pollinator, also antagonistic species like, like predispersal seed predators, also seed dispersal that may vary a lot in efficiency and in the ability of the dispersed seeds in adequate, uh, in adequate uh, situation for germination, herbivores for dispersal seed predators, herbivores on seedlings, herbivores on juveniles, and herbivory on adults, defoliation, and so on. So how can we document that? We are using now, we are analyzing now what you call multi-layer networks, where we can represent the interactions, the pay-wise interactions occurring for each distinct type of ecological interaction. So we have different layers to illustrate what's going on of the interaction, uh, about the interactions of plants with their pollinators, with the predispersal seed predators, with the frugivores, with the, uh, with the post-dispersal seed predators, with the herbivores, and so on. So that if we have here, uh, the nodes are the individual plants in a population, we have what we call a multiplex network, because the plant nodes are repeated in each layer, they are connected by those interlayer links, and in each within each layer, an individual plant is interacting with different partners, okay? Those are multi-layer networks where we inventory for the plants in a population, P1, P2, P3, and PI here, we can inventory all the individual, all the pairwise interactions that each individual plant in the population is having. We, we just monitor with different methods the type of flora herbivores, pollinators, seed dispersal or post-dispersal seed predators that occur in in that particular population, in, in a way that we can relate that with the fitness variations within the populations. And we emphasize also a, a, a less studied aspect of complex network analysis that is individual based network. That, that is networks that represent the interaction between individual uh, plants and individual animals. And that is what occurs in nature. No? So here, for instance, with uh, Prun Mahalev, I've been uh, I'm studying interaction between the individual uh, prunus trees in a particular population with the uh, animals that uh, uh, consume the leaves uh, on the trees, and then the interaction with the pollinators, and then the interactions with the seed dispersers, and so on. So that each individual tree, the same tree, can be connected here by those inter by those interlayer links representing the fitness effects that the interactions with herbivory have for this particular tree and then how they connect to the interactions with the uh, pollinators for that par same particular tree to the interactions with the uh, animal dispersers for that particular tree. And I have three layers here representing the bipartite networks of the individual trees. Those are the yellow triangles here with the different numbers labeling the individual trees with a suite of herbivore, herbivore species, antagonistic effects, with a suite of pollinate, pollinators here, and then here with the seed, with a suite of, of uh, frugivores dispersing, dispersing the seed. There are many things we can uh, do with that. We are, we are now in the lab, we are studying several systems here. This is just a, a toy example built with the uh, previous studies here in southeastern Spain, in, in Cazorla Mountains, 
with uh, Pronuma Halep, where uh, I inventoried the uh, herbivory pollination and seed dispersal, all the interactions with the different animals, uh, consuming leaves, uh, pollinating the trees and dispersing the seeds for those individual trees here. And you can see there are a lot of species here. And then what I'm interested in, in looking at what are the main drivers of the complexity and the stru structural properties of those multi-layer networks. How the individual trees build, so to say, so to speak, will there are inter individual interactions with the whole suite of animal species that have in either of those uh, uh, herbivorous or pollinator or seed dispersal assemblages. So this is a main goal. Uh, those are some, some preliminary uh, reports. Here we have just a, a simple uh, uh, modularity analysis where we see here the different three individuals in, the, in, in that particular population. Those are photographs of individuals in those different those, those different modules, and you see that we can identify subsets of the trees in a given population that are interacting not just with a subset of the pollinators or with a subset of the frugivores or with a subset of the herbivores, but with a subset of combination of pollinator herbivores and frugivores. So it, it's kind of of a tunnel view of all the progression of biotic interactions that is occurring since the trees is, uh, start to produce the leaves in the spring, in early spring, until the tree in, in late autumn uh, finishes uh, dispersing the seeds in that particular population. And, and we see here beautifully that we have different subsets of the trees that appear to, in, to interact with different combinations of different uh, biotic interactants. And, and we are interested in examining what are the correlates of variation in phenotypic traits across uh, those trees in the population that ex better explain the structure of the and the topology of those of those uh, multi multi-layer and multiplex uh, networks. So, for instance, we have here the position of the trees in those networks that could be characterized, for instance, by the multi-layer eigenvector centrality, the dots here would be the trees, and the multi-layer eigenvector centrality will be, will be proportional to the centrality of that particular tree individual in the whole suite of interactions with all those antagonistic and mutualistic animals. And we can find, we can, uh, find some interesting correlates. For instance, uh, there is a positive association that uh, it, it was totally unexpected for me uh, at the start of the study between the number of seed dispersal, the, the, the fruit removal and seed dispersal success of the individual trees and the Igenberto centrality of that particular individual. So it appears that individuals that are more central, not just in the interactions with the frugivores at the, in, in the seed dispersal stage, but also are quite central in during pollination and also quite central in the network, in the antagonistic network with the herbivores are those trees that finally have higher fitness in the population. Or here, for instance, we can characterize the node, node strength. So what is the, what are the summit contribution of a particular tree to, in, to quantitative interactions with all the partners that we are characterizing in that particular population? And then we see here quite clearly uh, what is the role of tree size. So it appears that large trees in the populations are quite important because they tend, tend to concentrate quantitatively most of the support of those networks of interactions. We are losing in present day communities because of deforestation, because of selective logging, we are losing the giant trees in the population. And the larger trees in the population are extremely important in supporting the whole biodiversity of biotic interactions in those in those in those populations. Uh, I don't have much time to explain here, but uh, multi-layer networks can be used, for instance, to to uh, explore the degree of assortativity or disassortativity between the different type of networks, and then uh, play a little bit with that, and then see what type of biotic interactions and what type of functional outcome, outcomes are having central effects on the stability of those 
of those networks. This is really challenging. And from a, a conservation biology perspective, it is quite problematic. Why? Because we are trying to understand highly complex systems. And we have really a challenge in trying to understand the whole diversity and the whole size of this biodiversity interacting because of its, its complexity. So recall an interactom in any complex system, any biotic, for instance, a protein-protein interaction network, a gene-for-gene gene regulatory network, or an integrated circuit, any complex system has an interactom. The total number of interactions in, in a complex system are the total number of connections that can be established among the N components of that particular system. Those are bad news. Why? Because the number of interactions, of potential interactions that can be built in a system with N components is what we call in, in, in complexity science, the Bell's number. Bell's number is the number of connections expected for a, a complex system with N, N components. So Bell's number for a system with three components would be the number of di di different ways in, in, a, in, in which I can connect three different components. There are five ways that you can connect just three components. You have three nodes, you have five ways to connect them. For then for, for just for five components, you have here the 52 number of different ways that you can find interactions among them, just five components. For 10 components, there are more than 100,000 ways to connect that. So ecological system that we can explore at a community level or even at a regional level or a biome level, for instance, for the biome of the Atlantic forest in, in Brazil, how many different components do we have there? Plants, pollinators, seed dispersers, uh, frugivores, uh, herbivores, mycorrhizae, fungi, and so on. How many components? Depending on the geographical scale, we could reach maybe one million. Then we found, we face, when trying to characterize the complexity of those interactions, we face what the people working in complex systems, like this paper of Koch in science, shows is the complexity break. The complexity break is what stops us from understanding very complex system. Why? Because there is no way to prove the, all the component interactions among a highly complex a system that have a very high number of components. The number of components, Bell's number, incre increases here supra exponentially with the number of components. So we need some tool, we need some framework to avoid that knowledge gap, that knowledge break, that complexity is putting in front of us. We need network, we need network tools. It is completely impossible that we prove, we probe experimentally every single interaction that we have in a plant pollinator interactions, in a plant frugivore interaction, in a plant, plant mycorrhizae interaction network. It is completely impossible that we explore all those billions of interactions that occur when we have very large system. We need theory, we need concepts coming from network theory to try to understand subsets, modules, subset, uh, cores of those networks and try to identify whether something special and something important for the stability of the whole network is residing there. And we need to focus our conservation effort in those particular subsets that are holding highly crucial, crucial interactions for the persistence of the whole system. I'll stop here. 
simply that we are facing an unprecedented loss of biodiversity on, in our planet. And the IPBS report of uh, 2019 very clearly explains that. It's terrible, the pace and the speed at which we are losing species. But we are not only losing species. We are losing interactions. We are losing, we are getting more and more extinct, extinct biotic interactions that have many pervasive effects in natural ecosystems, like delays in forest regeneration, collapse in forest regeneration, loss of carbon stock, loss of uh, the potential for, for storage of carbon in the forest, loss of connectivity in metapopulation, meaning that the, the, the potential for restoration of large tract of vegetation can be impossible. And um, even we have some events of rapid uh, evolutionary change in those changing conditions. So, but I, I, I don't want to leave a, a pessimistic view. We have tools to understand that. We have tools to identify potential technological uh, bottlenecks where, for instance, in our re in forest restoration project, where we might focus, where we might focus for having a more successful restoration project. What are not only the species that we need to, to restore, what are the interactions that are fundamental that we restore, not only species. Also, what are the interactions that we want very quickly functioning there in those systems? We have the tools, we have the knowledge to focus on those problems. So I'll finish just thanking all the people in the lab, very especially Alfredo Valido and Néstor Pérez Méndez here uh, for their, their work with the, with the lizards and also Cristina Garcia here, the work with uh, Brunus and all the team is really a privilege and, 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 and a pleasure to work with them and also with my inter international collaborators like Jordi Vasconte now in Zurich and Jen Solesen in, in Denmark and in Brazil, my very good friends, uh, Paulo Guimaraes and Mauro Galetti and John Thompson in California, in Santa Cruz. And thank you very much to all of you for your attention. Thank you. I'm not hearing you, uh, Jeff. Sorry. Oh yeah. Oh no, not so. Okay. You're hearing right? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. I was saying that it's always humbling hear about your studies and uh, how much we learn about ecology and how how we can find smart ways to use uh, network tools to advance ecology and conservation. And it, I think it's a great review of what are networks, what are the structural patterns that emerge, but also the impacts of uh, deforestation, defaunation, fragmentation, uh, on seed dispersal, and other important ecosystem functions. And it's really, really cool. Um, so we, we have many people here congratulating as well and thanking you for the amazing talk. Uh, Thank you. We have a comment yes, from I'm someone. I think you know who are. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Paulo yeah. Guimarães. The usual that. suspect. <laughs> <laughs> so he says that's amazing. The long dispersal uh, distances modulated by predators. And uh, we have a question from Juliana Cordeiro. She says. Uh, around the year 2000, studies on bipartite networks increased rapidly and analytical tools were quickly developed as well. It looks like the same is not occurring for multiplex networks. Do yeah, you absolutely. agree and has any insights on that? Uh, yeah, of course, I, I totally agree with you, Juliana. And, and specifically, uh, we are having problems in, in, in developing uh, analytical ways to handle multi-layer but by party, by party network. So most of, of the efforts so far to uh, with uh, analytical methods for 
for multi-layer net, networks come, come from the sociology, from sociological sciences. And they put a lot of emphasis on, on unipartite networks of personal interactions or interactions in corporations or uh, transfer of funds and among banks and all that. So we have mm, less developed uh, analytical tools for for multi-layer bipartite networks. Well, but uh, we are working with that and, and there are ways also to think, circumvent those problems. So, so I foresee uh, uh, a, a, a very nice future for for those different approaches and certainly uh, network ecology i think that will be will be crucial in, in many different types of of approaches that that we can take to 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 understand uh, biological questions and ecological problems thank you pedro we have another question from tiago fernandez uh, could we see already any short time community response on the uh, size of seeds after the loss of large dispersal agents? Yeah, of course. Uh, there, there are two types of. Uh, if I understood well your 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 question, Tiago, you mean changes at the community level, and um, uh, at the community level there are two types of of changes. One is the type of mer merely uh, resulting from merely mm -hmm. filtering out a subset of a species that is non-random relative to the to the range si seed size distribution in the original community. So we are losing the large seeded species. We are getting communities of a small seeded species that are not only a small seeded species, but also are soft woody species with much lower uh, carbon storage capacity and blah 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 and probably also they differ a lot also in the in the ability to rebuild the network of interactions with with uh, with mycorrhizae in the ecosystem but I, I i don't know anyone that is explore is, is exploring that but certainly that filtering out of the large seeded species is resulting in a, in a totally different community a, a totally different physiognomy of the forest, a totally different community in terms of plant species, plant species composition. And then the second effect is uh, that I, I think that you are thinking also in that particular effect is the, the actual evolutionary change in seed size resulting from the suppression of the facilitative effect that the large frugivores have uh, when uh, they are able to disperse the very large seed. So if you are a large fruited plants and you are losing your main large bodied frugivores, then you are experiencing a very strong selection, natural selection pressure to decrease fruit size so that your seeds will be dispersed by smaller and smaller frugivores that are left in the smaller and smaller forest family. That's the way it functions. And together with Maura Galetti and other uh, extraordinary colleagues in Brazil, we have been documenting that rapid change. For instance, in, in a keystone species in, in, southern, in southeastern Brazil, that is uh, the, the um, Euterpedulis, the Palmito Jusara. The Jusara uh, is uh, severely decreasing seed size, in seed mass and fruit size in the defaunated areas. I mean, we, we find a, a trend for a lower seed mass in, in, in Palmito. And my my gut feeling, my guess is, is that that is only occurring. It's not only occurring for Palmito Jusara. It's also occurring in other large seeded, seeded species in the in the Atlantic Forest. That we can have those pervasive effects in in the that actually we can we can assist we can witness this evolutionary change in the life of, of a researcher. I mean. Those are changes that are occurring very, very quickly. Why? Because the selective force, the, 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 the strong force of nat natural selection, that defaunation is imposing in those systems. For a large seeded tree in a defaunated area lacking large frugivores, the seed dispersal success, success collapses in the same way that we, we have seen here for for the neocamaelea and the galotias in in the defaunated 
islands in, in the in Canary Islands. Exactly the same process, exactly the same. A truncation, a collapse of, of sea dispersal success. Hmm. Wow, many, many questions here. Many questions, many people thanking you. Thank you, so thank have, you to all of you for, for your patience. We have a question from Hernani, he says, I think my question is much more simple than the complexity of your talk, but here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so when we when we usually consider a mutualistic interaction for seed dispersion simply when the seed is present on the feces of the disperser. However, uh, dispersers can have negative effects on the germination of the plants or even not disperse on a proper site for its development. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, of and, course, and I, then, I agree. And, 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 and so, sorry, Jeff, you, you are. And then the, the rest of his uh, questions Do you have any ideas or suggestions about how to take these ecological factors into consideration when considering a plant animal interaction to be mutualistic? Hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, of course. Th thank you, Nani, for, for your, for your uh, most interesting question. Of course. Yeah, we are. We are using those techniques just to identify the pairwise interactions. That that's a that that is a, a pretty first, very very first uh, step in trying to understand the, the functional consequences. And of course, we 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 have been working a lot with uh, developing the together with uh, with Jean Shup and and Roca and Jose Maria Gomez. El, El, we have been uh, working a lot in trying to develop a framework for seed dispersal effectiveness, where we incorporate both the, the quantitative and the qualitative effects that characterize the outcome of an interaction between a frugivorous species and a plant species. And that is for what you are mentioning, and that uh, takes into account may, many other variables. But first of all, uh, you need to visualize and to understand the complexity of those interactions. And for that, you need the basic, the very basic item of, of knowing with uh, high precision who is eating whom and who is depending on whom and, and who is inter interacting with who. And, and after that, you, you can overlay other different, other different types of, of approaches that focus on what you mentioned, of course, but I totally agree. We have a question from Jason Gladich. In the multilayer networks, do you think it would be possible to track changes in higher layer networks due to perturbations in lower level networks? For example, an introduction of new herbivore or laws of pollination may change frugivory interactions. Absolutely. That uh, thank thank you, Jason. That that's a that's a very good point and a, and a very good suggestion. I think that the the way to to proceed with that, I I I'm sorry that I I haven't thought very much about that problem only only briefly, and I think that a lot of potential lies in 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 the use of null models and uh, null modeling appro approaches. I mean, when you incorporate, you have an observant network, a multi-layer network, and then you can you can uh, incorporate a change, incorporate a disturbance in any part of those network, any type of uh, disturbances affecting the inter interlayer links, any type of disturbances affecting the within layer links in a single layer at a time, in multiple layers each time in a variable fractions of, of uh, each layer, I think that uh, we can use this type of null model approaches uh, to, to try to understand and to test hypotheses. So the fundamental question here is, what is the biological questions that you, you are asking uh, for the multi-layer framework? Let's say it's question A. Okay, then under the situation for A, we have this multi-layer topology, this multi-layer structure. Then what happens when we put a disturbance 
in any component of that multi-layer architecture. Um, those type of disturbance, disturbances can be very easily propagated throughout the whole multi-layer structure, I think. But I need to, to think much more on that, but it's a very good point. Thank you. We have a question from Kate Maya. Is the individual multi-layer Prunus network, uh, is any of the layers a better representation of plant centrality for the whole multi-layer? If one layer is more related to the whole multi-layer centrality, that's clue of which interactions should be monitored to favor multi -layer, uh, multiple layers. Absolutely. Th thank you very much, Kate. That is, that's a, a very clever suggestion and, and very very good questions. And, and, and great to see you here, by the, by the way. Uh, yeah, el, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so el, one thing, uh, one thing that there are several metrics in, in, in multi-layer networks that you can develop, uh, for instance, to assess multi-layer centrality. Um, and there is a relatively simple way to partition that centrality across the different layers. So in terms of what would be the contribution to the centrality of other species of the ways that the species interact in that particular layer. And then for each layer, the, the, there are also the, the uh, descriptors for the, uh, the whole layer centrality, the whole layer contribution to the multi-layer centrality. So you can play with that, of course. And, this, and, and, and then, yes, I, I, I agree that once that you have those type of uh, statistics, those types of, 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 of algorithm, uh, those types of, of indicators, you can develop those that are more biologically meaningful for assessing that question that you pose that is very important. How can we identify the particular subsets, the particular sections of uh, a given net network uh, so that we can take more care or we can function, we, we can focus more more specifically our limited resources for restoration, for management purposes and all that. I, I think that would be crucial with complex systems like those. If we are not able urgently to develop those type of diagnostic tools, we'll be completely lost in terms of, of our potential success to successfully restore functional ecosystem. I think that's a very serious challenge that we are facing now. Very good question. We have um, a final question. Uh, Tiago Fernandez asks, um, are there practical restoration projects that focus on ecological interactions? Mm -hmm. Would it be necessary political actions to make sure restoration is more usual? Mm. That's a, that's a very crucial aspect, Tiago. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there, there are some 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 efforts in, the, uh, for instance, in in several examples come to my to my mind, and there have been some uh, simulation and some work, also empirical work, also for instance in Seychelles by by some people there with uh, plant pollinator interaction networks to try. To, to restore the network by also restoring uh, interactions. And also, uh, for instance, there have been, uh, and is, uh, there is some interesting work also in the in, um, University of, of, of Rio de Janeiro by Alexandra Pires and Fernando Fernandez and all that team with work by Luisa Genes, for instance, and, 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 and other and others that are working on restoring not just the species in the Tijuca and the famous Tijuca forest, but also restoring the interactions. They, they have been assessing how the reintroduction of the agutis there, of the cutias, or the howler monkeys, how that uh, is contributing to the restoring the uh, seed dispersal functions for some uh, focus species. And, and that those are very interesting approaches. And certainly, uh, in terms of, of uh, restoration efforts, certainly I think that I would like I, I'd like to see 
restoration ecologies focusing not just on restoring a species, but also on restoring the functionality of ecosystem. But I think that the, the, that is progressively is being done. Is is being done in recent years, especially in the last five years. Yeah. I think I totally agree. I think this is one of the next steps, next frontiers in network ecology, right? Restoration. Mm -hmm. um, just I have a final question, Pedro. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be useful for our students too, uh, to hear what or if you could, could comment on what you believe to be the next major steps uh, regarding the application of network theory in ecology. I think you already touched on many of these aspects, but if you have any other input. Mm -hmm. I, well, that's a, a very interesting question. And, and, and as I said uh, briefly, I think the, there is a, a quite vigorous community of, of, of researchers now working on plant-animal interactions quite broadly, in not only mutualistic interactions, not only uh, plant plant frugivore interactions or plant pollinator interactions, but even more broadly, um, there are several challenges there. I, I've been posing to me one of the the most interesting now that I'm focusing my research research to that is the issue of complexity. How can we deal with ecological complexity, and um, what are the techniques that we need to 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 develop? What are the frameworks, the knowledge frameworks that we need to develop to to be able to fully understand all the all those derivations of the complexity of our study system? And in terms of ecological networks, well, I see that further uh, advances and major advances can come from uh, those approaches that assume multilayering or multiplexing of the uh, of the networks because they appear to be, at least in other areas, for instance, in, in, in public transportation, in public transport, and, and also in, in, in urban, uh, urban studies, uh, studies, in urban architecture, in urban design. Uh, it, they are being quite useful for asking new questions. So when we have, we recognize the ability of systems that are quite complex by themselves, they, like plant pollinator interactions are extremely complex. And you have another layer of complexity with plant mycorrhizae interactions. And, and then you have a framework that allows you to connect those two new questions emerge. And those new, que new questions, the emergence of those new questions is completely unexpected from what we know about each system se separately. Is it pops up? I mean, is it coming new? So, and also th that's uh, certainly uh, an area of of, of uh, future advance. The other area I see will be will be a methodological, purely methodological. We are using. I've been uh, telling a lot about uh, about DNA barcoding analysis, but also now we are. Uh, we are seeing new development, de developments in large scale monitoring of biodiversity with drones, with the remote sensing, with uh, camera traps, very sophisticated camera traps, with uh, audio moths, with uh, large scale monitoring of soil, uh, soil communities, below ground soil communities. I mean, those techniques will allow us to, to make to pose questions that have a much larger, larger scale, a much broader scale than the questions that we are now focusing. So probably those would be very useful for, for addressing some interesting questions about the macroecology of networks. So uh, we have a very solid theory of the what we call the biogeography of a species and i like very much to, to see a, a strong theory of the biogeography of interactions so yes yeah, <laughs> yeah so there are there are many many interesting many interesting questions yeah. of course 
Thank you for the summary, Pedro. So uh, I just want to mention briefly uh, that our next seminar will be given by Dr. Adrian Esquivel Wilbert at uh, August 5th at 10 a.m. in this channel too. So we'll keep you posted on the social media. And Pedro, once again, on behalf of the program, uh, graduate program in ecology, I want to thank you very, very much for accepting our invitation. It's really a pleasure to have you here and learn from you. And I'm sure our students are uh, really benefiting from your knowledge. And I hope people, uh, this, this um, talk will be uh, posted or be on YouTube for a long time. So people will benefit uh, from this in there too. Any final words, Pedro? No, th thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, for me, it has been a pleasure, and not, not only a pleasure, also a, pre a real privilege to, to have sometimes to, to talk about our research here and also have this uh, great discussion and, and getting those very interesting points and suggestions and questions. And it's always a privilege. Thank you. Thanks ever so much for, for inviting me to the, to the seminar series. And I look forward to, to see you in person very, very, very soon. So. Me too. The privilege is ours. Thank you so much, Pedro. Thank you.